the recording for us. Hello, Meg. <laughs> Hello, Julie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, it's, we were just talking in the green room that um, we're doing Zoom, but the first time that we actually hosted Meg at Warwick's in person was for the book, The Wednesday Sisters. And that was how, how many years? When did that book come out, Meg? Oh, you're asking the hard questions. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm hitting your heart right at the beginning. <laughs> no, I think it was 2008. Uh, it was I'm pretty sure it was 2008, a long time ago, long 15 years ago. Long time ago. ago. Yeah. So we've yeah. been we've been friends and and supporting and loving your work for a long time. So um, you are one of my favorite stores and will always be. <laughs> thank you. Well, we appreciate you. One of our favorite authors. We are so excited to learn more about this new book. Um, I can't wait to get into this. So. I'm going to get Facebook just a minute or two just to notify people that we're live and that we're here. A couple things about Warwick's and what's going to happen tonight. So, Meg, you're calling in from the San Francisco area, correct? I am uh, actually now in Carmel by the Sea, so about uh, an hour and a half uh, south of San Francisco. You know, not quite two hours south of San Francisco now, yeah. Not a bad place to be. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> very, nice. very similar in a lot of ways to La Jolla, sort of. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of little similarities there. Carmel is one of my favorite places like that yeah. drive up the coast for us is just fantastic so it's gorgeous. lucky lady living there that's for sure yeah <laughs> not, a bad not as warm there. not as warm as you guys are but uh but um we you know we moved here officially in may and we're, we're quite happy so yeah yeah well and i imagine um because the weather's a little bit more that foggy thing see see sitting inside and writing is probably not a bad thing to happen when that's <laughs> that kind of weather <laughs> yeah although you know i think maybe there's something to do with um climate change but we have seen very little of the fog you know it's uh, so often just really beautiful here uh, especially this time of year it's been yeah. really stunning so yeah that's well there's good in the, so the other side of the coin there on that stuff right oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is a okay, good place so, to write yeah so I won't chatter on too long because I know everybody that's joining us wants to get into the meat, the nitty gritty of this, but just real quick, Warwick's is look, look, like I was talking about located in La Jolla, San Diego. Um, little sign there says 1896. We celebrated our 125th anniversary this year. So yay, yes, 125 more years. <laughs> so um, tonight, uh, Meg's going to talk about the Postmistress of Paris. And um, what you can do is in the, we are, we're recording this, so it's going to be on YouTube as well. But if you're seeing it on YouTube, sorry that we're not live and I'm not doing anything in the comment section there, but you can always just Google Warwick's and order the book from us if you'd like. But for those of you that are joining us on Facebook tonight, I'm going to put the link to the book in the comment section. You can easily click that. If you're in the San Diego area, we would love to see you at the store. Lots of great things to buy at the store on top of books and Meg's book and all kinds of wonderful things for the holidays. We do free gift wrapping. There's parking in the back. So lots of things to do at Warwick's. Um, also in that um, comment section, go ahead and put some questions in. Meg's going to give us a great PowerPoint presentation for about 20, 25 minutes about this book. And then we would love to have your questions about this book or any of Meg's books. So go ahead and um, stay active in that comment section. We'd love to hear from you. So with that, I'm going to do my formal introduction of Meg, <laughs> and then we'll go on to the, uh, the wonderful PowerPoint. So Meg Wade Clayton is a New York Times bestselling author of seven prior novels, including the international bestseller and National Jewish Book Award finalist, The Last Train to London. I loved that book. It was such a good book. Published or forthcoming in 20 languages, which is incredible. The Langham Prize honored The Race for Paris, The Language of Light, a finalist for what is now the Penn Weather Bell Prize, and The Wednesday Sisters, which I said was, I think, our first time hosting you. One of Entertainment Weekly's 25 essential best friend novels of all time. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good statement there about that book. That was nice. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good statement. Because that means it's like a perennial. It's just one of those that... <laughs> It's with, you know, the, the uh, some of the other books on that list are like uh, The Three Musketeers, you know. So, well, there you go. Yeah. There's a, that's, a, that's a friend book for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she has written for the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and the San Francisco Chronicle, the Washington Post, and Public Radio, often on the subject of the particular challenges women face. We, we just talked about where she lives in Carmel by the Sea. And with that, Meg, I'm going to turn the um, table over to you, and I'll see you in about 20 minutes or so. 
Thank you, Julie. It's just really nice to be here with you and really nice to be here with everybody. Um, I don't know about you all, but I'm a writer, uh, which means I spend um, my time playing in my office playhouse with my imaginary friends writing books. Um, my days in this complicated time we're muddling through aren't so completely different than they've always been. Um, but uh, um, but despite still getting to spend my days pretty much as they've always been, I miss so many people. Um, so it's really nice to be connecting with you all uh, in this way. Um, and the upside is I can invite you into my office playhouse. Um, so welcome. Um, and uh, please, you know, as we're talking, feel free to uh, ask anything about my workspace or the way I work or, or anything like that. Um, thanks to Julie and everybody at uh, Warworks for making this happen. As she said, I'm going to talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I'll talk about the novel, uh, some of the history behind it, and how I wrote it. Uh, and for that, I'm going to share these images. So um, uh, let me um, hold on. Um, I'm going to screen share for you. And um, uh, I should warn you that some of you may be um, a little bit uh, shocked by what you're about to see. Surprised, uh, disturbed, maybe? I'm not sure. Let's see. Now let's see if I can make this happen. Screen share. Okay. Uh, this is me, circa 1970. Uh, I'm 11, um, already in my second year of braces and just about to go on that most horrible of shopping tip trips for a girl not yet in the sixth grade to buy my first brassiere. Um, we'd moved to Los Angeles for six months to a neighborhood without any other children, uh, leaving me to the mercy of my four brothers uh, and the company of books. Uh, so what I did most mornings was ride my bike to the library where they were having a summer reading contest. All you had to do to win was read the most books. So I, of course, chose short books, uh, wanting to win. Um, but then the librarians began putting books like A Wrinkle in Time and To Kill a Mockingbird in my hands. Uh, and in reading those longer books, I began to imagine becoming a writer myself. Um, so fast forward uh, about two years, I'm in this eighth grade, uh, back in the Chicago area where I mostly grew up, and I'm um, asked to stay after school by my English teacher, Mrs. Thompson. Um, I was a good student, but not always uh, well behaved, so I imagined I was in for a scolding for some misbehavior I had. Um, but what Mrs. Thompson wanted to talk to me about was a poem I'd written, which she wanted to encourage me to submit for publication. Uh, so I submitted it to the own magazine I knew published poetry, which was Seventeen magazine. Uh, well, they rejected it. It turns out Seventeen publishes poems by Pulitzer Prize winners and not generally stuff written in purple ink on line paper by 14 year old girls. Uh, it was 20 years before I ever submitted anything again. Uh, that's a whole nother story involving late night drinking and one amazingly supportive guy. Um, but in case you don't think that early support meant the world to me, note that I still have this poem I wrote nearly half a century ago. Uh, so if there are any librarians uh, or teachers uh, out there, uh, I just want to say thank you for the way you inspire us. Okay, so the Postmistress of Paris. Uh, the premise is uh, a Chicago heiress converts a French chateau into a safe haven for artists and writers she helps smuggle out of Vichy, France. Um, both the real heiress, uh, whose name is Mary Jane Gold, and my fictional one, who are called, who's called, I call her Nene. Um, they're actually from Evanston, Illinois. Uh, that's a town, if you don't know, north of Chicago, near where I spent most of my growing up years. Um, although I'll tell you, the houses I lived in were uh, pretty dodgy compared to the mansion that uh, Gold grew up in, uh, never mind her Michigan summer home. Um, but like Gold, my Nene moves to Paris when she's not yet 20, and she's still living there a decade later when Hitler invades. Uh, she joins the effort of fero fellow American Varian Fry. Uh, who came to France with this secret list of um, notable artists and intellectuals, uh, writers and um, thinkers and musicians that he could get American visas for, if only he could get these folks out of the hands of the Nazis. Uh, we're talking artists like Picasso and Matisse and Chagall, uh, writers like Hannah Arendt, uh, Nobel laureates and um, and others, some of whom it would turn out actually did not want to be gotten out. Many of those on Fry's list uh, had been put in internment camps by the French even before Hitler invaded. Um, yeah, you heard that right. Uh, like Germany, France interned Jewish refugees even before the country fell to Hitler. Uh, they were considered enemy aliens, perhaps even spies for Hitler, uh, never mind that they were Jewish and had to flee their homes uh, to safety in France. Um, this camp, 
Campton Mill was in an old brick factory uh, before it was uh, converted into an internment camp. It was a, it was an old brick factory. And a lot of artists and intellectuals ended up there because of its location, which was uh, in Provence, um, where many of them had settled. There's this, this uh, little town on the coast called saint Marie sur mer No doubt there's somebody who can pronounce French better than I can and will tell me how to properly pronounce it. But it was referred to jokingly at the time as the capital of German literature. Uh, so Mary Jane did some awesomely courageous things to help these uh, folks get to freedom. Um, a lot of what I know about her comes from this book she wrote called Crossroads Marseille 1940. Uh, you might notice the cover is in French. I will spare you the long shaggy dog story about how it's out of print in English, but I managed enough mangled French uh, to buy a copy in a Paris bookstore. Uh, but let's just say that the effort it took simply to buy it communicating in France uh, French uh, should have been a sign of how long it would have taken me to read it in French. Uh, so fortunately, I found uh, a copy in an English library. Um, the real Mary Jane Gold found and rented this ramshackle villa called Villa Airbell, uh, where a whole group of people working to smuggle uh, refugees out of France uh, lived together. Um, and I should tell you, uh, and they even they hit, even had some of the refugees there until they could uh, be uh, gotten out of France. Um, and at the same time, they had a, a lot of fun. Um, and so I'll tell you that when I first pitched this idea to my literary agent, the idea for this book, um, her name is Marley Rusoff, uh, and it was just an idea at the time. It was a, a couple of paragraphs, and, and she said, uh, "With a piano player, we'd have a female-driven Casablanca." Um, so put a pin in that. I'm going to circle back that in, in a few minutes. Um, so one of the things they did is they hosted these salons um, at which they played these really crazy games they made up. Uh, the image on the left here is uh, the result of a communal drawing game uh, they called Exquisite Corpse. It started as a word game, um, pretty simple. You have uh, uh, however many plays you have, three or five or whatever. And people, you know, somebody does a noun, somebody does a verb, somebody does an adjective, adverb, uh, all uh, blindly to what the other people are doing. And then you put it together in a sentence. And the name of the game comes from one of the early sentences that was created in this game, uh, which was the exquisite corpse will drink the new wine. Um, and then it became a, uh, a drawing game. And that's what you see here on the left. Uh, somebody, they fold a piece of paper into three pieces. Somebody draws a head, somebody blindly draws the body, somebody bl blindly draws uh, legs, or as you can see here, a tail, and you get these uh, crazy, crazy um, creatures. Uh, and there was um, the, the, the thing on the right here is a deck of cards that they designed because so many of them were artists, not kings, queens, and jacks. Uh, that was too monarchist and military for them, uh, not what they believed in, uh, but rather a genius, siren, and magus. Uh, they often have held their salons out on the Belvedere at Villa Airbell, uh, where they literally hung art in the trees. Uh, this is Danny Benedite, one of the real heroes who plays a role in uh, the novel, a hang, hanging a painting uh, by Max Ernst, a surrealist who uh, plays a small role. And I will tell you that uh, the minute I saw this particular photo, uh, I wanted to write this story. So this real Chicago heiress, Mary Jane Gold, is part of the inspiration for my postmistress, which is a code name. Um, but my novel is actually a bit of a mashup. Nene flies the same kind of airplane Mary Jane Gold did, which is this red Vega Gull. Um, my Nene has an adorable dog named Dagobert, again, like the real Mary Jane Gold. Uh, my Dagobert has this funny habit of barking madly every time anyone says the name Hitler. Um, and Dagobert is the first major dog character I've ever written. Uh, and I will tell you that I did a channel our uh, last dog Frodo in writing him and don't tell. Uh, but Frodo is not a poodle, but rather a, a golden retriever. Um, but anyway, that Hitler thing, the real Dagobert, Mary Jane Gold's uh, dog actually did that. Sometimes you just can't make it up better than it really happened. Uh, so my Nene is definitely a large dollop of Mary Jane Gold, uh, but I also tossed in a bit of a German refugee whose name was Lisa Fitko. Uh, she, pay, played a, she played a huge role in helping refugees escape, uh, but I can't tell you what it is or it will spoil the read. And of course, there's a lot of, of fiction in Nane too. So 
the postmistress of Paris is one part of the story of this courageous American woman, uh, but it's also the story of the refugee artists who fled Hitler's Germany for safety in France, only to be arrested and confined in these French internment camps. The experiences of my photographer Edward, um, who flees the Reich with his toddler daughter Luki and her stuffed kangaroo, Professor Ellie Mouse, uh, only to end up in peril in France, are drawn from the real experiences of men interned at Camp de Mille, children hidden in Paris, and refugees trying to escape over the Pyrenees. Um, the men interned at Camp de Mille lived and ate and slept in this old tile factory that was still so thick with brick dust that they described the way it made the floor uneven to walk on and filled their lungs. In what is a truly incredible testament to the human spirit, they made what used to be the underground kilns into little studios uh, to create art in. Uh, they even set up a nightclub of sorts in one of the kilns. They created art wherever they could, including on the ceiling beams. Uh, on the brick walls, and they're, they were surrealist, so some of this is uh, pretty funky, like this one is one of my favorites. Uh, and in the camp hall. Uh, they wrote symphonies. They also performed in a sort of a makeshift theater that they set up in that camp hall. And just to be clear, they, that camp hall is like not where they ate or anything. They ate in that same um, bare room that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, so the same thing for plays, they wrote and performed them there too. Uh, not only the internment, but also the staff and the camp captain came to see them, see these shows. Um, these were some pretty amazingly talented, often famous men, and the shows uh, would have belonged in any of the world's most famous venues. Um, so these photos tend to make Camp de Mille look uh, like a cushy experience. It was not, even under the Free French. But after Hitler invaded, the plight of the people in turn there became more dire. Escape became more necessary uh, and extremely dangerous, not only for the prisoners, but also for people like Mary Jane Gold and Marion Fry, who helped them escape. Um, so the story then becomes really a dangerous race against the clock to save lives. Um, Quite a few of the characters in the book are drawn from real people. people. Uh, and when I stick pretty closely to their real stories for their bits in my novels, um, I use their real names. So for example, this is Varian Fry on the top right of this uh, photograph here, um, who brought the list uh, and established and read the, led the rescue network that is the center of this novel. Um, they conducted it under uh, the cover of the CAS, the Centre American de Secours, um, which helped refugees in le legitimate ways. Uh, and I should say this photo, like um, many of the ones that I'm using here, um, come from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Muse Museum. Uh, this is Bill Fryer. Uh, he was a Viennese cartoonist uh, who was the network's forger. He could reproduce the official commissaire de police stamp and the official signature like nobody else. Uh, so unfortunately, he was caught forging documents and uh, eventually deported uh, to Poland and ended up uh, first in Auschwitz and then Buchenwald and Dresdenstadt. Um, he did survive, but I hope that will give you a sense of how dangerous this effort was. Uh, this is Gussie Rosenberg. He was a 19 year old Jewish man who could pass for an Aryan teenager, uh, which was pretty handy back then, as you can imagine. Um, he ended up as a literature professor at Bard College here in the United States and just passed away on October 30th at the age of 100. Uh, this is Leon Fuschwanger, which I'm no doubt mispronouncing, but uh, he was a Bavarian Jew and one of the world's most popular writers in 1940. Um, he fled the Reich and settled, settled in Santa Rosa sur mer and when the war broke out, he was declared an enemy alien and was interned in Camp de Mille. Um, this photo is uh, from a display at Camp de Mille. It's been um, preserved as a museum and is well worth a visit if ever you are in France. Um, this guy is André Breton. He's one of the writers this rescue effort saved. He was actually French and a Gentile. He was not Jewish. But his writings were banned uh, and he was wanted by the Nazis. So he and his wife and daughter actually lived at Villa Erbel for many months before they could be gotten out. Um, he was the leader of the surrealist movement. And as you can probably tell by this photo was quite a character. Now, okay, so um, I think I will read uh, about two minutes, just the opening page, page and a quarter 
um, so that because um, I'm going to go through a little bit of how I wrote that this particular passage so you can see my writing process and I'll tell you that uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is um, what I uh, had in front of me as I was uh, working on this scene and um, okay so I think I'll just read the opening uh, paragraph so just so you have a sense of it um, Monday January 17th 1938 in the sky over Paris the sky out the glass roof of her Vega goal was as crimson as the airplane. Beyond the windshield and the gray whirl of propeller, 10,000 tons of iron stood laced against the setting sun. Nane called over the roar of the Gypsy Six engine, La Dame de Fer à son meilleur nouveau. That's the kind of art I love. To Dagobert, her sole passenger, who wagged his unkempt poodle tail as they circled the Eiffel Tower, the Iron Lady at her best. Okay, so so um, so Nene starts in this plane with her um, with her dog Dago Bear uh, in the passenger seat uh, next to her, um, and so that's what I had. This is what I had in front of me as as I researched and wrote it, um, so that so often it's easier just to describe what is actually uh, there as opposed to kind of trying to make it up in my mind. Um, and so this picture, for example, of the dashboard, that's the real dashboard of that bigger goal that I showed you the bigger picture of um, that uh, woman named Sue Holm um, sent me her dad uh, flew one and um, so she had lots of pictures from it. And she sent me things like, you know, for example, uh, you, uh, you, I don't know if you, I don't know the, yeah, the, you see the propeller in that opening paragraph. Um, I hadn't realized that that's what you would see you so much of what you would see is the propeller out the airplane window until she sent me a shot of you know looking out the window and I saw oh you see a lot of propeller there you see that gray whirl of propeller so. Um, so as I write I try to gather as much uh, around me as I can. Um, uh, and. Um, and I'm just going to give you a peek into kind of how I did that. So it opens with a nay over, a nay over Paris. And um, of course, I would love to have used that as an excuse for uh, how to fly a small plane myself, or at least get someone to fly me over Paris. Um, but by the time I realized that's where the novel would start, we were into this COVID thing. Um, and so instead, I uh, found uh, people to help me. And one of them was Sue Holm, who I just uh, mentioned. Um, and then uh, the other one, and, and really the scene would be nothing like it is if it weren't for the help of this uh, fellow, his name is Christopher Keck. Uh, he was a friend of a friend. Um, and what he did was he set up the path Nene was going to fly over Paris on flight simulator, um, actually using the specs of that very Vega goal. So I could see how that very plane would behave, uh, what Nene would see uh, as she was going, the speed she would be going, and what would happen if, for example, she uh, went into a stall and had to recover from this stall. Uh, and he shared it with me by Zoom and reworked it and reworked it and reworked it with me and read the chapter to make sure I was doing the language, using the language a pilot, pilot, pilot would use. Um, and so I'm give you just a 10 second look at what was many hours of zoom, but so you can imagine this is Nene approaching the Eiffel Tower. Eiffel and head over to the arc. Um, we're going to drop down to 800 feet. So he just did things like tell me how, um, how fast I could go, how low I could go, you know, what happens when you go too low or too high or whatever. It was quite uh, quite an education and I'm so grateful uh, to his help. Um, of course, one of the very best parts of writing a novel set in France is being able to spend months there and call it work. Um, and so this is actually me at the small cascade in the Bois de Bologna, which is uh, later in that chapter what Nene uh, dips down to see. Um, and that's all in that opening scene. Uh, after Nene lands, uh, she changes from her flight gear into uh, first into this uh, purple, purple Chaparelli jacket. Uh, she doesn't like the look uh, any more than I would have. Um, and so she immediately takes it off in favor of a more classic black Chanel dress, uh, lots of pearls, and this Merritt Oppenheim designed Chaparelli. Uh, for a cuff bracelet, uh, which is an actual work of art, uh, an actual bracelet that was sold by uh, Chaparelli at the time, and um, is an element that echoes through the story. I was just rereading uh, Alice McDermott's new book on writing um, last night and was reminded she has this line about 
you know, pay attention to anything that a writer uses in, in a story because it's not there just to be there. It, it almost always does extra work and I hope that is true of mine. Um, don't panic if you don't know who Mara Oppenheim is or even Schiaparelli. Uh, I didn't either before I started the research on this. Uh, and in the book, I'll either tell you uh, or make it clear from the context or honestly, mostly you don't need to know. Uh, and I promise there will be no pop quizzes after you finish reading. Uh, so then in the chapter, Nene rushes off to an opening of a surrealist exhibit um, that really did open in Paris on the day it does in the post mistress of Paris. Uh, so for writing that, I found um, this flyer you see on the upper left, I guess it is. Um, so I had the uh, details of who organized it and when it was and all that kind of thing. Um, I gathered photos of what it looked like outside in the courtyard at the entrance. Um, so I would know what Nene is seeing in what turns out to be literally about one sentence as she arrives. Uh, but she sees this car uh, that's out there. It's not a car that brought anybody. It's a work of art. Uh, it's called, um, it's by Salvador Dali. And it's called, uh, alternatively, either Rainy Taxi or Mannequin Rotting in a Taxi Cab. Uh, and you can't see it from here, but the back seat actually has a female mannequin um, who is sopping wet and covered with live snails. Again, this is surrealist art. Um, and so I found a lot of other images of the exhibit itself, uh, including this one at the bottom. Um, don't tell the docent, but I took the real works of art uh, down from that little display that they're in there and I hung in their place uh, the fictional photographs uh, taken by my fictional Edward for the scene. Uh, so at the exhibit, an NA first encounters Edward. Uh, so I begin to gather information about the kinds of cameras and photo gear that he would have used, along with images that um, show me some of the funky things that the surrealist did uh, with photographs, so that I could um, so that I could use them in various ways. Again, to carry the emotional weight of the story, as well as to kind of um, reveal what uh, what people did at the time. Uh, so I gather lots of images around me, um, and I also gather documents like this interzonal postcard, um, which for a lot of the period when France was split between occupied and free France uh, was the only mail that people could send out of occupied France. Uh, later in the novel, this cable is sent to the State Department, uh, from the U.S. State Department to Varian. Uh, and it is, what it says basically is uh, uh, Varian, stop annoying um, Vichy and Hitler and uh, uh, come home. Uh, and he was doing, they knew he was doing things uh, that were violating the laws of uh, France and um, and they were, this was before the U.S. was in the war, uh, and they were trying to uh, maintain uh, friendly relations. So uh, despite this cable, which uh, Varian got, um, I think, less than a month after he went there, he, when, he, when he went to France, he was only meant to be there for a couple of weeks. Uh, he ended up staying uh, for nearly a year after that. Um, this cable, like so many things, you know, I didn't need to see it, but there's something uh, about seeing it um, that makes it feel more real for me. And um, so I collect things around me, many of which I never use, but they sort of put, put me in the world I'm, I'm writing in, in a, in a more physical way, uh, so that hopefully I can put the reader there as well. Uh, so the novel's titled The Postmistress of Paris, and I do certainly hope you'll enjoy the loop around the Eiffel Tower and the touches of Paris fashion and art and uh, in the inside of one very swanky flat that's exactly where the real Mary Jane Gold's the Paris apartment was. Um, but it could just as easily have been titled The Postmistress of Provence. Uh, that's where Kim de Mille is and that's where Villa Herbel is. Uh, and this is me wandering around the um, Panier district. Uh, of Marseille. Um, it's, um, you know, it's pretty graffiti and kind of not the nicest part of Marseille even now, uh, but it looks a lot nicer than it did when Jewish refugees hid in its brothels and underground caverns and where my nene um, risks her own safety to help them. Uh, the novel might be titled The Postmistress of Chenon So, uh, this gorgeous Loire Valley chateau literally spanning the Cher River, uh, which was the dividing line between occupied and free France. Um, you can see from this uh, top left uh, photograph here um, that this is um, this is how it bridges the Cher River. So, you know, those, those arcs, it just bridges the Cher River. And um, the inside 
uh, shot that you see is the gallery that's in that part over the river. And it was literally um, used to smuggle people out of occupied France. So those uh, doors were at the, that, that you see at the end there are in some ways the doors to freedom. Um, uh, but of course, uh, Vichy France was not free France, uh, even though it was called free France. And um, and the Germans were pretty loose about the border as well. So even when you got through those uh, doors, you were not necessarily safe. So Casablanca was my agent, right? Um, yes, piano playing is involved. Uh, it turns out uh, Varian Fry was a piano player and there was a piano at uh, Villa Arabelle. Uh, but so also Nazis, cocktails, transit papers, and even lovers who first meet in Paris. Uh, but when my agent called me after I'd actually written this novel, uh, and she'd actually read it, um, she didn't mention Casablanca. She instead shared a story I'd never heard in our two decades of friendship about how her husband, who grew up in communist Romania, learned English by memorizing Arthur Miller's The Incident at Vichy from a cassette he had to keep secret so nobody would know he meant to escape, which he ultimately did. Um, she said that in capturing the loss of home that uh, leaving Europe in 1940 meant, it captured uh, her husband's uh, loss decades later and that of today's refugees. Uh, you know, I personally have left so many homes, but I've never even left my native country and still it's never easy. I think we so often judge refugees, kind of what have they done to deserve to live here without considering the impossible decision to leave even the most dangerous of homes. Uh, so I hope people re um, read and enjoy The Postmistress of Paris as an adventure story and a love story and a story about people managing to have great fun even in um, impossible times. Um, but I also hope the novel will help us understand what leaving a life behind has and will always mean. And of course, I hope it does the real people involved in um, this real history justice and that my characters will inspire others as surely as uh, they inspire me. Uh, and I'm going to stop the screen share now, and I think Julie's going to rejoin us, and I hope you guys have lots of questions. Again, uh, I'm happy to talk about anything anybody's interested in talking about. That was so good. And it's like, because I read the book so quite a while ago, I got it in manuscript form, I think, a long time ago, you sent me one, and I just, it just brings back so much of the book. It was incredible. Thank you. Question for you, though, which I don't think, I was listening, but I, how did you find um, Mary Jane Gold? How did you stumble on her? Oh, it's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, um, the way I got there was, um, I, uh, you know, my last uh, book was uh, called The Last Gentleman and was about uh, Truth by Similar. She was uh, very involved in the kinder transport rescue of children right before World War II. And I was interested in just following, you know, what else she did. We were having some discussion about whether I would write something. I was thinking about whether I'd write another truth story or not, or another story with those kids or whatever. And so I was looking at um, what Truce did during the war. And uh, I knew that she had been, uh, she was arrested by the Gestapo in Vienna in the course of that book. Um, but then she's arrested by the Gestapo a second time uh, in the south of France. And so I was interested in finding out what she was doing in the south of France, and that would get her arrested again. And that's how I got to the south of France. I found um, um, a, a woman, a French woman, who was literally a postmistress um, and also a forger in the resistance. And I thought, oh, that'd be an interesting story. And so that's where the the postmistress part of the title came from. Um, but then in exploring around, you know, looking at her story, uh, I found these artists uh, and this Varian Fry's effort to get these artists out of France. And I thought, well, that's interesting too. <laughs> and so then I found a book by uh, Rosemary Sullivan. It happens to be also a Harper book, but I didn't even know that when I got it. And, uh, and it explores Villa Airbell and all the artists who live there. And that's where I discovered Mary Jane Gold. It took me uh, uh, quite some time to to find out more about her because it was so hard to find her um, her memoir. Um, but I, because I prefer to, be, I, I prefer my books to explore courageous women. I was looking for a, a woman to kind of hold on to as this for this story, and there were uh, kind of three three choices really: um, Lisa Fitko, who I talked about a little in that presentation, mm -hmm. um, Mary Jane Gold 
and then another American um, whose name was Miriam Davenport, who worked with Mary Jane Gold. Um, Miriam both exited the, um, the situation much earlier than Mary Jane did. Um, but also, there are just so many reasons I like Mary Jane, including that she's from Chicago and I'm from Chicago, even if she's wealthy as hell and I was not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, because that was the one thing when I was reading it, and I think the blurb that I wrote, I said something about the fact that you do such a fantastic job of melding the fictional and the facts and the and the real characters and your goo I was googling things it's like oh what did that look like um and the one thing is that what do you call them, the corpse pictures or what are the the three yeah yeah exquisite corpse exquisite, exquisite corpse. corpse how yeah. many of those did you actually find and see um, oh a bunch I mean because there it's a, it's a game and it's you know the surrealists of played it and I think people still play it all the time so it's uh and some of them are you know literally works of art that hang in you know that are in museums and, and things so yeah. yeah I saw lots of them there there some of them are really creepy some of them are very funny uh yeah. they're they're fun yeah they're interesting yeah and that's a so and I've got some questions coming in for Facebook too but I have sorry everybody I have my own that I've got to like <laughs> these things that I just need to know um, but going from the Wednesday Sisters, which is more recent history. The last few books you've done have really been, you know, these deep historicals. What was it? What was the catalyst that made that transition for you? Do you? Um, that's an interesting question. You know, I when I wrote the Wednesday Sisters, it was the second book I wrote, and it, it's it's set for people who don't know. It's a uh, set in the uh, late nineteen sixties and early nineteen seventies, and it and it follows a group of women friends uh, who never in a million years, with one exception, would never have called themselves feminists. But it's very much about how the women's movement changed the world for even um, even women who who wouldn't have called themselves feminists. It's also about a lot of things, you know, misbehaving husbands and um, health challenges and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's very much about, it's very much a writer's book. Um, it was one of its working titles was the Wednesday Sisters Writing Society or something like that. Um, but um, but I always thought of it as a historical novel. Um, and so then when I, my, my, um, my uh, publisher was at, uh, at Random House, um, I asked what I'd like to do next. I proposed this idea for these um, these women journalists in World War II France. It's always been a, a, a interest interest of mine. Um, women journalism, photography, World War II, and uh, and she said, well, they really would like to have another contemporary story. They didn't know if my readers would follow me to historical, and I, I thought, well, <laughs> I thought that was historical, but. <laughs> So I did a series. So I did a series of, of books with them that always had some kind of historical angle, but were more contemporary books. Um, and every time I'd be doing a new book, uh, they would ask me what I wanted to do next, and I'd say I have this idea for this World War II <laughs> women journalist story. <laughs> so, so it, the, I think the question is really why did it take me so long to to get to, to, make to that, this yeah. era? <laughs> you were always uh, but interested in doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I. You know. I. Uh, studied history in college uh, with an emphasis on 20th century wars and particularly World War II, and it's just long been a fascination of mine. So. Right. I mean, you're right. It's fantastic. You can tell that it's a passion. Um, yeah. But yet, it's the thing that I love about your books is that it's it's not just like all these facts thrown at you. You know what I mean? Everything, like you said earlier about the bracelet, it's like these things that you introduce that are important. And if you want to know more, there's Google can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those yeah. things, like you want to take that take that dive in um let me bring in a couple of the comments from facebook real quick and then i have some more of my own um laurie if you're still with us she just has a comment that says this is so wonderful to learn a part of world war ii history that people don't hear about in school and i think that is um the history books have one thing that they you know that they tell but a lot of it doesn't have to do with women usually yeah and you know there's this this great um uh, quote, um, uh, um, let's see if I can come with this. Uh, it's, uh, we, uh, well, it's less important to learn um, history lessons as to learn lessons from history. Um, and it's uh, Otto Frank, you know, Anne Frank's father. Um, and I think that's really true. And for me, uh, even as I was studying history in college, you know, one of the courses I took was called 20th Century Wars from the American Perspective. And a lot of what we read was fiction and nonfiction written um, from that ground level. So much of what you learn from his in history is, you know, dates and what 
Churchill did and not um, what it was like in, in the real world. And I think it's so interesting to explore that. So that's what I'm interested in, what regular people do during war. Oh, yeah. I mean, what are you eating? What's happening outside their doors? I mean, those kind right. of things that you just, you know, and like you said, that brings it more back to that refugee thing of making that decision you know, you think yeah. of just like airplanes and bombs and all the strategies of stuff that war is, but that's not what people are living. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Marco has a couple comments here. So he's asking, so would you agree when it comes to writing a tip to remember, and this sort of what you're saying, isn't necessarily write what you know, but instead know what you write, as your writer is not yeah. only accurate, but realistic, since depending on what you will write, you need realism. Uh, that is, uh, I love that. I've never actually heard that before, but I love that. Uh, yeah. Not write what you know, but know what you what you write. Um, that having been said, I think that um, uh, for me at least, and I think this is true for a lot of people, my best writing comes from things that you know um, rip my heart out of my chest and you know put it on the table and chop it up into little pieces. And um, and I think that if you write from things that move you deeply. Um, that that, uh, that 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 is also good advice. Right. So, yeah. And then the second part of his question is, how exactly would you describe the postmistress of Paris? Would you say the postmistress novel is a fictional autobiography, a fictional novel taking place in the real world during a real world period in history, or et cetera? Uh, I would call it um, a novel inspired by real events. How's that? Yeah, it's very, so, and the things that, uh, the the setting, uh, so much this uh, of the story is very true. The time, you know, if, if I say, you know, something happened on a certain date, then uh, either it happened on that date or I have a good reason for changing it. Um, the things that, you know, Varian Fry does in the book are the things that Varian Fry did, the people who live, with the exception of my fictional characters, the people who lived in Villa Arabelle actually lived in Villa Arabelle. Um, you know, Miriam Davenport leaves to go uh, uh, get her fiance from Poland and take him back to the United States. And that is what she really did. She left Villa Arabella to go to Poland to get her husband, her fiance, and bring him back to the United States. Um, so I like to uh, steep my stories in um, in real events. Um, but I also, uh, so like Nene is always called Nene. She's never called Mary Jane. Um, she is in one place. Uh, we see that gold is her last name. And that's because uh, one of the things she did was she provided a lot of money for this effort. And, um, and one of her things was she did didn't want to only rescue famous artists. She wanted to help ordinary souls to people who might, you know, deserved a chance to become famous. Um, and so they called, so they made a second list, you know, Varian brought his list of 100 people and then they made a second list and they called it of lesser known people and they called it the gold list. And I love that, the gold list. And so that's why I kept her last name. Uh, um, but I never call her Mary Jane because she's not Mary Jane. The right. real Mary Jane uh, ended up in a love affair with a um, Marseille gangster. His name was, his nickname was Killer. And it's a great story, but it's, it's way outside the the realm of you know what this story is about, and so I gave my fictional and a a fictional love affair with a fictional photographer. Which yeah, which is it's that's the beauty of the historical fiction part of that is you can play you can play with that, and so which leads me to on your research. So there's a ton of research that you do, obviously, and it's fun it's fun research too with being able to go on some of those trips and things. Do you completely do your research and know where your story's going or do you just kind of let it, let the characters kind of take you where they're going to go? Honest to God, I, um, I do outline and I do have a sense of where my story is going at some point in time, but honestly, sometimes you don't know where you're going until you get there. And I think that's very true of writing. And, um, and so I like to have an outline so that I have a roadmap of where I'm going. Um, but I also sometimes like to take a turn down a little lane that I pass that looks interesting and it might take me to someplace uh, really different. So so I do a lot of research before I start writing. Usually I'm researching one book while I'm writing the next. Um, but I also um, research, you know, uh, throughout. Sometimes you don't know what you need to know until you've written it. So like I didn't know until I sat down and started writing it. I didn't know that that story was going to start in the air over Paris. And so I didn't know that I needed to know what the inside of a big goal looked like until until I was there. I was like, oh, there, like, what does this I need to, I need to like? know this now. 
yeah exactly yeah so, so the they, process I'm, kind of goes along as you as you write you have to do a little you got to take those breaks and do that ex exactly and so i just am i'm always looking for new stuff as i as i need it and that kind of thing yeah yeah I yeah. love the research. It's like part of my favorite part of this because I'm learning. And, well, and um, it's, it's probably the, you know, you studied history and, you know, that's just part of who you, you know, your DNA exactly. make up to it all. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk character names. How, mm -hmm. because there, you've got some great character names in there and some of the real characters, so you obviously can't mess with those names, but the ones you make up, is that easy for you to do? Is it hard? Where do you get them from? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes they change names. I will say that, um, that Edward, uh, who ends up being Edward Moss, um, was Edward Milch for a long time. Um, and, uh, and then when I, when I sent the manuscript to my, uh, to my editor, um, she she said one thing. She says you have to take out some of these names of some of the artists. She said, I said she said because I'm just basically putting down the book to Google who the artists are all the time, you know. So, <laughs> um, but she said uh, maybe Edward Milch was too close to some name. I can't even remember what it was. And so then we went looking for uh, other names. And I wanted to because I was pretty far along in the book by then. I wanted to have it be an M name. I wanted to have it be a single uh, name. And so then I came up with the name uh, Moss. Uh, which happens to be my friend Alan and Kristen Moss <laughs> and so and they're dear friends and so I I emailed them I was like you guys I need to I need a last name Bar that, I need to borrow no. <laughs> and that's Jewish but not too Jewish and you know and could I borrow your name and they were like oh yeah we're so honored to do that so um but like yeah. Nene, so where did fun. that come from pardon where did, did Nene come from um do I I don't, uh, I don't remember. Yeah, uh, there's some, you know, so interesting how this works. There's some possibility that that was a real nickname that somebody called Mary Jane Gold. Okay. Uh, and it's also possible that I just made it up. Yeah. And and Lukey, is sure. it, how do you say, how do you say the little, is it Lukey or how, or? Lukey. Yeah. Lukey. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Lukey is totally different. made up. Yeah. And uh, I don't know where Lukey came from. I mean, so, uh, you know, in that opening scene, sometimes literally, it, you just sit down and write and sometimes things just come. Just and so I started writing that opening chapter and I knew Edward was going to come and I thought he was going to have a daughter, but I wasn't entirely sure. And then, you know, there's Lukey and she just shows up dragging her little mom here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know where that name came from. I, I don't know anybody named Lukey. Yeah, uh, no, it's interesting. Sure but I, I mean, I always find it fascinating before. because it's like, because you've got to name these characters and it's just, and then yeah. they become they become very real in a, in a sense, but they're just, they, you know, they do. I cannot imagine Lukey uh, being called anything else. And yet I, I don't know how she was named. You know, I do um, look for names. I look in um, lists because uh, I like to have period appropriate names and right. that kind of thing too. And so I will look at, you know, popular uh, German girl names in uh, 1930 or whatever. Right. Cause um, that is and, true. That's one of those things that'll zap you out of a story. If somebody doesn't have an, a, a time period appropriate name, yeah, like, were exactly. Really called that back then? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, and I like to give my kind of my my um, my my leading characters. I like to give them kind of memorable names um, right. that that you will associate with their character in some way. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so back to the research. Was there anything that you didn't put in, or that there's a couple of ways I can ask this question. Was there anything that surprised you in your research that you were just like completely blown away by? I think that's a uh, better know, there, question. There are always things that surprise me um, in the research. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's again, the fun of it. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the books that I read very late in the process of writing this book, um, it, it was, I, I actually had gone through several drafts of it and uh, a friend of mine, uh, whose name is Tom Fister, um, who, who, we'd practiced law together many years uh, ago and, and I didn't even know that he'd written this book, but he'd written this book and he, he wrote me and uh, emailed me and asked me if he could send me a copy. And, uh, you know, honestly, people are always sending me books. And But I like Tom, and I figured I would probably like anything he wrote. I had no idea what it was about. Um, but he sent it to me, and it turns out to be this wonderful book called Even Auto, which usually I have in my desktop, but I clean up a little bit today. But um, And it's about his 
parents, both his mother and his father, um, escaped, uh, were in the French resistance and escaped uh, from France uh, in the same way that uh, people did at the time. Um, and so it was, uh, it, that was a lovely surprise just that Tom had written this book. Um, it, it happened to have explore some of the material that I hadn't been able to research and so I just um, oh. made up and it was really uh, it was really one of the things that surprised me about that was this idea of how very hard it is to leave even when um, even when you're leaving uh, terrible circumstances and it really made me think more deeply about the story in Great. in ways that made it a much better book. So I'm so grateful to Tom for just randomly wanting to send me his book. Yeah. No, know? sometimes those are the things. It's like, it's like the surprises come from you don't know, but that's where the surprise is. <laughs> but it's, yeah, but it's exactly. also that in that it's realizing that it's not just, oh, let's just go buy an airplane ticket and go, you know, um, right. you know, the, there's a lot not easy for um, for that. Um, how long did it take you to write this one? Uh, well, so I researched it for for quite a while, um, but I will tell you that uh, we were, it, I was living in Palo Alto when the whole COVID thing really hit in a big way. Um, we were the first, one of the first counties to be uh, locked down, okay. to be shut down. Um, and we were uh, shut down on March 17th. And I will tell you that I had something like 3,000 words at, on March 17th. Um, and it was very daunting to write during the pandemic. Right, right. Uh, and so one of the things I started doing was um, every day I would mark in my journal um, three things. Uh, whether I'd done my weight workout that morning, this little, you know, seven minute routine I do in the morning, uh, how far I'd walked. So I, this is to keep me exercising, you know, and how many words I've written. Uh, and along with a running tally of how many words uh, I had a total in the book. Um, and uh, and what that did was allowed me to see, okay, this was only a crappy little 150 word day, or this was a good, you know, 600 day word or whatever, but whatever it is, they add up. And so you'd see it goes, you know, from 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 15,000, 100,000. Um, and honestly, because I, couldn't travel for a book promotion. Right. Uh, all my events were, I canceled all my events and then they were canceled anyway. Um, and uh, and there weren't a lot of other distractions. I wrote this faster than I've written anything really. I, I oh. started really in earnest in uh, March uh, and um, it's, it's something uh, odd happened. I, I will say that um, in Oct late September, early October, my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer mm -hmm. um, and and so I uh, called up my agent and I said, I got to help my mom through this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to ask for an extension. The book was due, I think in January, January 2nd, I think. I said, I think I'm going to have to ask for an extension. She said, no problem. She would call Sarah Nelson, my editor, and um, don't don't worry about it. So the next day, Sarah calls and I think, oh, good. Uh, Marley's talked to Sarah. And the first thing Sarah said is, uh, we're thinking of publishing this on November 9th, but it would mean that you would have to have it in, you know, no later than the due date. Do you think that's doable? I was like, no, wait, long wait, pause. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, like yeah, something like I lost a like, translation no. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But so, um, so long story short, she said, oh, no, no, no worry, no worries. Don't, don't worry. We'll, you know, publish it whenever it's ready and, and all that. Uh, and uh, we hung up and I thought, uh, November 9th, uh, my mom's birthday is November 8th. And what if I could give, what if she were still here? And what if I could give this to her as a birthday present? Uh, and so I called Sarah back up and I said, uh, if you, if you do this in November, I, I will, I will get it done. Uh, and so then I did, I just wrote, you know, I'd, I'd get up in the morning at five and I'd start writing and uh, my husband would come and knock on my door at 7.30 and 7.30 in the evening and say, don't you want to have some dinner? And he'd bring me a little <laughs> lunch and stuff like that. Um, and I wrote it really, really fast so that she would have it um, and hopefully be here to see it. And she is. Oh. And um, and so all the good stuff that's happening, um, People Magazine and um, you know, this gush in the San Francisco Chronicle. And Chicago we spent a Tribune's lot of years in Chicago weekend, and there's right? going to yep. piece in the Chicago Tribune and, and all of those she gets to enjoy. And it's um, it, there's so much joy in that. So so I'm oh. really glad we did it. Yeah. And it was grueling. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, 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 it is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work and and writing, I imagine, like reading during especially those first like few months of the lockdown and everything, all of us were, you just couldn't concentrate. It was just so hard 
to just right. focus and concentrate because there was just so much coming at us. Um, so I can imagine writing a book had to have been, I mean, just yeah, reading yeah. was hard for us. I can't imagine writing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't love writing under contract, um, but I was really glad to have a contract this time because it gave me, you know, it, I had to do it. I right. didn't, I couldn't say, oh, I can't write today. I yeah. had to sit down and write every day. I would never have had a hope of finishing it in time to turn it in yeah. time. And, and I really have, um, like, I grew up, um, you know, Irish Catholic and all those expectations. All those guilt. All that guilt. All that guilt. And, and I literally, yeah, right. I cannot, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I cannot not do it, you know, so, um, yeah. So it's amazing anyway, how that works. I don't know if our children are going to have that. I don't seem to have that, that <laughs> same sort of thing that we all have as those Catholic girls. That we I don't know that, that guilt. You know, all my friends are, my closest friends are both, mostly either Catholic or Jewish, and we, we joke that we, you know, we grew up in the same guilt, you know, <laughs> guilt steep like, environment. So we it's get a universal it, you know. guilt. It doesn't matter what religion it came from. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, we're almost running out of time, Meg. I could talk to you forever. Um, just real quick though, can you share what you're working on next? Um, if you are working on something next. Yeah, so I am working on something next. Um, I will tell you that, you know, I told you that story about the, 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 uh, what, the book that became The Race for Paris, which is about the women journalists. I pitched that book so many times and I, and I would be talking about it as my next book or what are you can write next? Oh, I'm writing this book about these women journalists. And it was only after I stopped talking about it being my next book that it actually became my next book. So it made me, um, it's made me a little uh, jinxy about the whole talking about it. But I will say that I'm going to do uh, that the current plan anyway um, is to do another, another novel that would be set in um, in Paris uh, in smack dab in the middle of the war. So the, okay. uh, you know uh, the last train to London was thirty eight. The postmistress of Paris is forty, and this would be a couple of years later. So they make a nice little um, trilogy of three stories, uh, just separated by a couple of years each. Yeah, it, and there's yeah. there's so many. There's so it's rich with each time period is so rich with things to delve into um yeah. and to, it must be hard to just pick one little thing to kind of focus yeah. in on because there's so yeah. much um, yeah. well this one is i will tell you a book about books which i'm very books. excited about so we love yeah. that yeah. meg it's always so wonderful having you um i wish you were down here in person but this is the next best thing and i loved the powerpoint it was fantastic me too. Thank you. Let me give a very quick um, uh, shout out to um, my friend Tatiana Soli, who is uh, newly down there. She used to live up here and she's newly down there and she's a wonderful, um, a wonderful writer. And also uh, she'll be Gouda. There were just two uh, wonderful friends who always, you know, whenever I'm down there in person, um, they show up and they have dinner with me and they, you know, Tatiana houses me, you know, gives me a place to rest my, my head and pours me a good wine. And so I particularly miss um, um, sharing the evening with them and with you, but I'm yep. really glad to share it with everybody who's here. And thank you. I all agree. For yeah. And I love, yes, two, two wonderful authors. Love both yes. of them. She'll be fantastic here in San Diego too. So Meg, until we see you again, maybe in the new year you can come down do a luncheon or something for this paperback. Something. I, would, we'll do something. I would love that. I would love yeah. that. And right. good to see you. Great seeing you too. Thanks everybody. Thanks for watching everyone. Good night. Thanks everybody.